Shanna Gardner was born into wealth. Her parents had money, lots of it. She was also raised in a devout Mormon home. From the outside, it seemed like she was living a very stable, normal life. She then met a man named Jared Bridegan during a trip to Florida. Jared was also a devout Mormon. They fell in love and got married in Utah in 2010. They began to live their lives together in Connecticut and began raising their twins, but then moved to Jared's hometown in Jacksonville, Florida for the health of one of their children. It was here in Florida where life changed for Shanna. Marital problems, allegations of cheating, and actions very inconsistent with her Mormon upbringing. This led to a divorce. This also led to endless battles concerning the twins. Shanna did remarry. She met Mario Fernandez Saldana at the gym where she worked out. They fell in love and got hitched. Jared also got remarried and had a child with his new wife. Then, Jared was murdered. Shanna skipped the funeral and moved to Washington State without her new husband. Then, the killer was arrested. Mario was arrested. And finally, Shanna was arrested, charged with murder, facing a potential death sentence. Shanna was in court today, and tonight, we continue our investigation into the murder of Jared Bridegan. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And as we begin this hour and the story we're talking about, let's remember that Jared Bridegan, the victim in all of this, um, left four children without a father. There are four children growing up without a dad. You've got his twins from his first wife, Shanna, who's been arrested. And then Kirsten, his second wife, he had two children with her as well. And now there's four kids growing up without a dad. And you wonder what life is like day in and day out for those children missing so much and this was you know you know sometimes there's a dad who's not necessarily a big part of his children's lives for whatever reason either they're not that kind of dad or they're away at work all the time whatever it is that wasn't jared right again i mean he worked hard but he he was a family guy that was his bottom line and despite the fact that he and his wife his first wife had split up there was no way he was ever going to not be a huge part of the twins' lives. Because that's, that's, who, that's who he was. That's who he was. And he was murdered. Now, he and Shanna's first wife had been split for seven years at the time of the murder. It, it's not like, you know, Things just broke up and things were ugly and there was bad feelings and all. No, they have been living and dealing with this, this breakup. And, and, and people, people get divorced. It happens. It's not, that's not a crime. It, it's very common. And for whatever reason, sometimes it's in the best interest of the children for the parents not to be together if the parents, you know, are, are not, if it's not working. Like you can have very functional lives apart, and you can be great parents apart if you are mature, if you are grown up, and if you put the best interests of your children first. It can happen. And, and in this case, they're split for seven years, and they both had continued their lives. Like, things didn't freeze in time. No, like, she met someone and got married. He met someone and got married. He met someone, got married, and started to have uh, more children. Um, she didn't have more children with her new husband, but, you know, she still had her, her, her original children, the twins. So, you know, this murder and, and everything surrounding it, it's a, it's a little bit more of a head-scratcher because of this, this period of time that lapses. Most of the cases, and unfortunately, we see a lot of these cases um, that we're tracking right now are, are in the, the heat of the battle as, as you're trying to figure it out. 
you know, recovering a couple of cases down in Florida, uh, two more in Florida, by the way. This, this is also a Florida case, even though they weren't originally from Florida. But two other Florida cases where, where the mothers are accused of killing the fathers of their children, and it's in the middle of, literally in the middle of custody battles. We're trying to figure things out. This one is seven years down the road. Seven years later. Now, something else you have to understand about this case that it separates. This is a death penalty case. Prosecutor was pretty clear. This is a death penalty case. And it should be. It's murder for hire. That's, a, that's an aggravating factor in and of itself. You're, you're hiring someone to take someone out. And the fact that you don't physically commit the murder yourself doesn't make you less culpable. In a murder for hire, I would argue, it makes you more culpable because that killer had no reason other than the money you were giving them to do it. So there's a lot at stake here. And let's go back again and, and keep in our minds the twins. They've lost their father, their mother, facing a potential death sentence in this case. So something else that's very different about this case is the defendant, Shanna Gardner, a lot of money. You know, death penalty versus someone with money you don't see that combination too often. And that's something we're gonna talk about in, in the program a little bit later on tonight, in this hour. It kinda changes the equation a little bit. You know, many times a defendant, you know, can kinda scrape it together and, and hire an attorney, but we're talking about real wealth here. A family that has a business that purportedly generates, you know, over $100 million in, in business every year. This is real money, so this case is going to be fought um, as, as hard as you can. Whatever resources the defense needs, they will have in this case. So, Matt Johnson, Court TV crime and justice correspondent, spent some time down in Florida, has spoken to Jared's family as well, uh, and has more for us tonight on this story. Jared Bridegan appeared to have it all. A new job as a Microsoft executive, living in sunny Florida with his wife Kirsten and four children. We had just had London, she was six months old, so things were good. Kirsten had two children with Jared, London and Bexley. They also shared custody of his nine-year-old twins from a previous marriage. On the week that we did not have the oldest two kids at our home, Jared would take them out to dinner. It was referred to as date night in this agreement. The agreement kept Jared and Kirsten in Florida. Bride again and his ex-wife, Shanna Gardner Fernandez, were in a bitter custody battle. What was that relationship like, he and his ex-wife? The relationship between us and his ex-wife um, was not cordial. Our communications were always in writing because there was not mutual trust between the two households. On February 16th, 2022, Jared had one of his scheduled daddy date nights. After dinner, he dropped off his twin daughter and son at his ex-wife's home in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, and headed home to St. Augustine. On the way, he stopped to get his two and a half year old daughter, Bexley, ice cream. She was in the back seat of his SUV. He then called Kirsten, telling her he loved her and would be home soon. How did you learn something was wrong? As time started ticking by and the time that they're usually home passed, I, I can't even describe it, but like, I just knew something's not right. Her fears became reality after an officer answered Jared's cell phone, telling her Bexley was unharmed but they needed her to come by the police station to hear about her husband. They later on that night told me that he had been shot. Where did this happen? Because he usually gets in the car and just drives home. I had talked to him. Jared was not a victim of any robbery gone wrong or carjacking. Police say he was the victim of a targeted attack on a one-way road he traveled often. Jared came across a tire police say was intentionally placed right here in the middle of the road in the sanctuary neighborhood of Jacksonville Beach, Florida. That's when someone came out of these woods and ambushed the father of four, killing him on the spot. 
for almost a year, no answers. Then in January 2023, a break in the case. Henry Tenen was arrested for the following crimes. Conspiracy to commit murder, second degree murder with a weapon, accessory after the fact to a capital felony and child abuse. Now investigators say that Tenen has pleaded guilty in the case and admitted to shooting Brightigan. Henry Tenen pled guilty to murdering Jared Brightigan. Henry Tenen has admitted that he in fact was the shooter. According to court records, Tenen once lived in this house that was once owned by Brightigan's ex-wife's current husband. And now investigators have charged both the ex-wife, Shanna Gardner, and her husband, Mario Fernandez Saldana, with first-degree murder. We will be filing a notice of our intent to seek the death penalty. Prosecutors call Gardner the mastermind behind the murder. Both Shanna and Mario have denied any involvement. Meanwhile, Jared's widow says that she suspected them from the beginning. Had you suspected that Mario was also involved in all of this? From very, very early on, um, I felt, like obviously I didn't have any evidence, but I felt that Mario Fernandez and Shannon Gardner would be involved as, somehow. So Shannon Gardner, it took a while to before she was arrested and she had moved from Florida and was arrested in Washington state and has to be extradited back to Florida to be tried for this case. But as I said, lots of money fighting extradition, uh, a big development today. Uh, take a look. Uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has signed the extradition warrant for Shannon Gardner and the warrant is en route to Benton County, Washington. Uh, her hearing that she had today was continued to October 5th to allow um, Washington to receive the warrant. So there's a lot of, if you don't waive extradition, there's a lot of hoops that um, uh, the states have to go through to get someone from one jurisdiction to another, but that now is underway. So let's uh, talk more about this story, this relationship, this alleged murder plot. Joining us in Los Angeles, California, senior reporter for the DailyMail.com, the host of Daily Mail Crime on TikTok, and victim advocate for Project Cold Case, Caitlin Becker's with us. Caitlin, great to see you tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, when you think of this story, and, and we are tracking a bunch of stories where you have these battles, to me, what makes this one so different is where they were in their relationship. I mean, they had been exes for almost a decade at this point. They'd been exes for almost a decade at this point, which puts, I think, the status of their relationship, it makes very clear that they were still involved in this very protracted custody battle about their children, their twins who were nine years old. And they were still going on with this and it was still contentious. And the ex-wife was still kind of fighting him every step of the way. So if in that amount of time, they couldn't come to some sort of reasonable agreement about custody. I think you get an idea of how tough of a relationship these two have had. And we know, as you guys have just spoken to Jared's widow, his ex-wife, Shanna, has also given interviews in the past, long before she was arrested. And they were both sort of showing each side. And I always had a problem with the fact that Shanna never seemed sad or uh, visibly remorseful that he had passed away and never seemed too concerned about her children or Bexley who was in the car. Meanwhile, Jared's widow is giving interviews to plenty of people because she wants this case front and center. She wants her husband's killer brought to justice. And to compare those two, I always found it really, really fascinating. Yeah, because regardless of, of what you think um, about each other after the breakup, I mean, these twins have a father. Now they don't have a father. And to not feel something or show something that your twins have lost their dad uh, is, is very insightful. Um, I want to put this up. This is from August 17th, uh, Fox News report. And it, it talks about the relationship between Shanna and Jared when they were married. Uh, the Florida ex-wife of murdered Microsoft manager Jared Bridegan denied having an affair that ended their marriage. But her former personal trainer, who says he was her one-time lover,
contradicted her claim in an interview with Fox News Digital. As a Christmas gift in late 2014, Jared Bridegan bought his then wife, Shanna Gardner, a package of training sessions. But the fitness instructor said the relationship turned romantic weeks later. And, you know, maybe that's the, a, a symptom of what was wrong in the marriage or the cause of what happened, what went wrong in the marriage. But, but either way, um, this wasn't a situation where he left her. It wasn't. This seemed to be a situation where they were two completely different people when they lived in Utah, where they first got married, where they first started their family. And then when they moved to Florida from the investigations that we've done and the reporting that I've done, it seemed that Shanna's entire kind of personality changed. She started looking a little different, acting a little different. Her priorities had really changed. It was very odd that this sort of gym gift became a little bit of the catalyst for her changing behavior. She started to care a lot about her appearance she started going to the gym a lot more and then as you saw from that statement apparently allegedly got romantic with someone at the gym and then of course we find out that she gets married and when she gets married later she met the guy at the gym so it doesn't seem crazy to me that she would have had a previous romantic relationship with someone that she met there and it seemed that jared was kind of the same old Jared that he was when he met her several years prior to that. So it just seemed like they started really moving in separate directions and that her behavior became really problematic for his values. And another issue that often arises in these breakups and issues of, of custody, et cetera, is money. But for this couple, that's not an issue. I mean, he's done very well for himself she comes from incredible wealth, so it's not like she's ever going to be homeless or not have everything she needs. So that's like not even in the equation. And because sometimes that adds fuel to the fire in the, in, the, in the bad feelings between one another. Oh, he's got a nicer house or I can't afford this or I'm not getting that. that they both had everything they needed in terms of, of, of money. The thing is, Vin, just because you have everything you need, if you are the type of people that have a lot, you don't often like to see you having to give it up for anything. So just because she could afford this and her family does come from this immense amount of wealth, I could see a situation where she would get upset about having to pay for X, Y, and Z. Just because you have the money doesn't necessarily mean that you A, want to spend it, or B, you don't want someone else to spend it for you. And I think that might have been a little bit of an issue. It's not like either one of them didn't have it, but I do think that there were pro probably plenty of scenarios where Shanna may have not wanted to spend her own money and may have thought he was required. I don't know if it was because he was the father or what, because of their tension of their relationship, that maybe he should have shouldered more of that burden. I mean, people, people are selfish. I don't know this woman, but it seems very plausible that she could have wanted things just for the sake of wanting them and then gotten upset when she didn't get them. Like complete sole custody of the children. Now, that's something else that she didn't get. It was, it was shared custody, which you know, is, is very, very normal these days, especially when you have in, in, both parents are very involved in the lives of their children, a level of shared custody. And this murder took place right after a drop off. That always stuck with me. I mean, Vinny, I am the product of parents that were very involved and had shared custody. I split my week as a kid growing up between my mom's house and my dad's house and I went back and forth and sure there was tension occasionally, but my parents were really involved. And something that happened in my childhood was I went to my dad's at the same time every week and I came back to my mom's at the same time every week and we kind of just drove the same route because it became habit. And that is exactly what happened in this scenario. So they would trade off weeks and on their off weeks, each mom and dad would get a night to hang out with the kids and go to a special date night to have a special dinner. And at the end of that, they would drive the kids back to the house they were staying at. And from what I understand from Kirsten, this is exactly the same scenario that I had growing up where my mom or my dad would drive the same road after dropping me off as they took to take me there. There was only kind of one way that they went. So it's 
more than plausible that Shanna would know exactly how Jared was driving home after dropping off the kid and the twins, the two kids. And I do wonder if, uh, let's say hypothetically, and she is innocent until proven guilty, but let's say hypothetically the prosecutors are right. Did she know that there was a chance two-year-old Bexley could have been in the car. And when those children were dropped off, did she see that two-year-old Bexley was in the car? And was there an opportunity there to maybe call this off? If this did go, how prosecutors say it did go, and we don't know that for sure, was there a chance to call it off to maybe spare that little girl the chance of getting hurt? Thank God she didn't, but that was a risk. Oh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm wondering, sometimes um, his wife would be with him. Jared would be with his wife and his other child. Like, all four of them could have been in that car. Who knows what would have happened then. Uh, Caitlin Becker, great to see you tonight. Thank you so much. Caitlin Becker, uh, senior reporter, DailyMail.com. Okay, when we come back, we're going to talk about um, why. Why? Like, it, 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 to me, this one still makes no sense. Plus, coming up next hour. In the low country of South Carolina, big news, Alec Murdoch back inside a courtroom for the first time since his double murder conviction as his attorneys try to delay his next criminal trial. Tonight, all the details surrounding the next Murdoch trial later this year. This is just another attempt to get more publicity, to, to, to make this another national case. And, Your Honor, I'm offended. Uh, with the, the, the attorney general is waiting. He's got many other cases that are much older than this, but get granted, court TV won't be there for it. This is another effort in creating a national spectacle. Tragedy in the Hollywood Hills. Prominent therapist Dr. Amy Hardwick found fatally injured under her balcony. Her ex-boyfriend on trial for her murder. She had had a restraining order against him. He strangled her, lifted her up over the balcony, and dropped her. He never intended on killing her. Is this a case of a jilted lover turned obsessive stalker? The Hollywood Obsession Murder Trial. Trial coverage weekday mornings at 8, 7 central on Court TV. What I can say is that um, Jared was broken, right? He he really wanted to stay together um, for the kids. I think that was his top priority is, was raising the children. And um, the divorce really took an emotional toll on him. And um, we were so happy as a family to see Kirsten come into Jared's life. That's Adam Bridegan talking about his brother Jared. And there's Jared with his new wife, Kirsten, um, and had two children with Kirsten, had twins with Shanna, his first wife. But Shanna has now been charged with orchestrating a hit on Jared that ended up uh, with him losing his life. The man who pulled the trigger has admitted to it and has implicated um, the man he says hired him, who would be the new husband of Shanna. Um, let's take a look at the, the timeline here so you get a better perspective when, when things are happening. Because to me, it's such a big part of this story. Jared and Shanna get married in 2010. 2015 um, is when they divorce. That's when things fall apart. They have the twins. Uh, the custody disputes follow and both parents are sharing custody, okay? Both parents involved in their children's lives. That's what we like. Uh, 2017, Jared marries his second wife, Kirsten. Okay, does Shannon get jealous? I don't know, but she meets Mario at the CrossFit gym where Mario worked as a maintenance man, and they get married uh, in, in 2018. So they meet and get married uh, quickly there as well. Um, but then you move ahead. Four more years from there, that's when Jared Bridegan is shot and killed, and then Shanna gets full sole custody of the twins at that point, up until the point she got arrested for the murder. Um, take a listen to Kirsten Bridegan, Jared's widow, talking about what that relationship was like between um, Jared and Shanna after both had gotten remarried and, and had to 
share custody of, of the twins. Everything is a fight. So when Jared was alive, Shanna would take us to family court over and over and over for what we thought were frivolous lawsuits. She didn't win most of them um, because the judge saw through what she was doing. Um, and that was the entire relationship. We never spoke on the phone or in person. It was all via text or email. So everything was in writing. Like there was just zero trust from us for them. Which is sad, but it happens. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, both parents, it's always better if both parents, if they're involved in their children's lives, can be there. You end up with, with better children, you know, better humans who are, who are growing up. They've lost their father. Um, let's bring in our guests joining us uh, tonight, this hour. We have with us uh, Ves Mitev, family law attorney, represents uh, um, the accused Long Island serial killer's children, who are 1,000% innocent of everything. He's joining us in Stony Brook, New York. In Los Angeles, California, Jim D. Simone, trial attorney. And in Orlando, Florida, uh, psychotherapist Dr. Janie Lacey, CEO of Life Counseling Solutions. Great to see everyone tonight. Uh, that's, you know, I'm, I'm listening to the description of the way things were being handled. This is like seven years down the road. The parents have shared custody, but, but never talked. There's no trust. Everything has got to be written. And, and, and she keeps taking them to court all the time. To me, uh, that's an ugly picture. Well, it's something that you know, we, we tell our clients all the time. You know, if you have a contentious case and it's ongoing, you want to have everything in writing. You want to have text messages. You want to have emails. You want to have applications like our family wizard so that there is no dispute about who said what when where and why and and having everything in writing there's a purpose to that if you're constantly in litigation or if you think you're going to be brought back in held back in court time after time and it happens all the time so yes it's good to have these things in writing and we tell our clients you know if you really want to prepare yourself for court make sure it's all good to go and buttoned up uh, it's does not make for a, a conducive uh, interaction person to person but if you are finding yourself in a contentious litigation dispute with an acrimonious ex-spouse. And, and in this case, obviously, it took seven years for the embers to uh, to be blown up into what's ultimately, you know, now a murder for hire case. Uh, it, it would have behooved everyone to have everything in writing. Uh, Jim, what are your thoughts? Uh, the, the description is she keeps taking him to court and she keeps losing. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, clients, when they keep going to court and they keep losing, um, how poorly do they take that? Well, she probably took it very poorly, and it's unclear because, you know, sharing custody, as you pointed out, is really the ideal situation. I mean, they say, uh, no offense to any family lawyers, but the only one who wins in divorce court are the lawyers, especially when people are going back to court. I think that one issue here is the danger where she seems to have somewhat unlimited resources. So she's able to go back into court over and over again with these frivolous complaints, as his wife said, and it really ends up... Um, being more acrimonious than it should because you know she could never if she leads herself to a position where she indeed did a murder for hire she is not thinking of the best interests of any children whatsoever and that appears to be her pattern here dr janie lacy let, let's presume prosecutor's theory is right here obviously the presumption is the other way in the law They're, she's presumed innocent but how could someone get to the point where they believe that hiring someone to murder my children's father is the solution to my problem. And, and how, how do they get to the point where they think they can do that and get away with it? Well, there are high conflict divorces, relationships, and co-parenting, but not everyone gets to that point. So that would tell me that there's something more going on with Shannon if she is 
in fact guilty. So when we look at going to the courtroom, especially if she had these unlimited resources, it's almost like using the court as her playground to send a message. So I would assume the power and control and looking for whatever the narrative is that she created in her mind, he became the sole block and the sole reason for whatever challenges she may have had, especially if she was used to being in control in whatever form or fashion. But if she gets to the place or got to the place where he's now just an option object and not someone that she once loved and not the father of her children, then there's this psychosis that can be developed and she's looking at him as an object to be rid of and then almost thinking to herself as she's above the law with no consequences, especially if before this occurred, me not knowing Shannon and not working with her, but if there's been a history of her getting her way, using her resources, being a sed a sedu seducing people in order to get people to, to essentially give her what she wants. And then this is the one area where she's not able to get what she wants, then there could have been this obsessive nature and then looking at him as a potential object uh, to be removed. Okay, Vess, I wanna put this up. This is from the Florida Times Union uh, report, August 18th of this year. To give you an idea of what's going on, what was going on in this battle. Um, the court file has about 300 entries and motions. Gardner, which is Shanna, accused Jared Bridegan of disturbing and abusive behavior towards their children. And he accused her of spying on him and treating him in a disparaging manner in front of the children. So when you see accusations like that flying back and forth, um, you taking them with a grain of salt. Do you think th th it, it could have gotten to this level where your one spouse is spying on the other? Well, I think we've all had the cases where the court file is red flagged and the court and the judge and the court officers all know the litigants that keep coming back in front of them time and time and time again. And if, of course, if all these little paper cuts, death by a thousand paper cuts, and then and then obviously uh, they have to, at some point, put a stop to it. And, and this is where family court lawyers really, I think, have to earn their keep, which is to dress up allegations that are ordinarily nothing more but, you know, way and chaff and, and turn them into something that they can stand up in court and argue over with. So. Yes, can they? That can something so you know tedious and so so you know uh, what one would say is just completely bare bones and, and minutia. Can that transform into something that ends up with somebody dead? Absolutely. Will it take a long time to get there? Sometimes. And then again, sometimes it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And one thing that it could have been completely innocuous is sends sends the whole cascade over you know o over the edge. So yes, we we come across these cases a lot of the times, but. Uh, if, if the court is sick of it, that does not necessarily mean that the parties are sick of litigating against each other, because for some of them, it's their lifeblood. Dr. Janie Lacey, um, he was described as being broken um, by his brother, that he didn't want the marriage to break apart. Uh, I believe she's the one who filed for the divorce. There were allegations that she was cheating with the personal trainer um, that he hired for her or gave her a certificate for at the gym. Uh, she denies that, but... Um, what are your what are your thoughts about the fact that it, it, this isn't the normal case where you know the man leaves the woman and she's just angry about all that? It's like it, it seems like it was the other way around. Well, Vinny, it is actually very common. It's just that we mostly will pay attention to when husbands cheat or when husbands have narcissistic tendencies. Women cheat, women lie, women have narcissistic tendencies, especially if there were certain things in motion. So when I heard and I watched the interview of his brother talking about his broken heart, him not wanting the relationship to end, that's something that I see very common, especially if wanting to keep the family together. And sometimes more, more times than not, the husband will feel like if there's a divorce, then they won't be have as much access to the kids. So really thinking about the family unit and putting the kids first, more times than not, husbands actually do stay with their wives when there's been the wife has been abusive or she's been um, accused of cheating because they want to keep the family intact and they want to have access to their children. So if there was some things that were out of his control and him believing potentially that he wouldn't have as much access to his his children, I completely can see why he would be brokenhearted and really wanted that marriage to stay together and potentially my assumption would be to forgive her for whatever harm she brought to the relationship for the greater good of the family. All right, our guests are staying with us. Thank goodness, when we come back, we're gonna talk about the other aspect of this case, which is it is going to be a death penalty case.
What impact were, will her wealth have on that? And how about her co-defendant, her current husband? We'll talk about that when we come back. On Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020, Sydney killed her best friend, her mother. The shock remains in this Wallhaven neighborhood of Akron. Why? Why did that happen? An Ohio woman pleads insanity in the stabbing death of her mother. This is not a case about who did it. These lies were built and controlled by Miss Powell. The voices are getting louder. This is going to be quite a case. The Mother Stabbed Murder Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings at 8, 7 central on Court TV. at the outset of this investigation we would not relent until we uncovered the truth of Jared's murder the whole and entire truth this morning a fourth circuit grand jury indicted Shanna Gardner for first degree murder conspiracy to commit first degree murder solicitation to commit first degree murder and child abuse all related to the murder of Jared Brightigan Shanna's ex-husband Gardner was arrested shortly after and taken into custody by ATF Washington Field Division agents in West Richland, Washington. Gardner will be extradited to Duval County to face these charges. We will be filing a notice of our intent to seek the death penalty, as we have also done in the case of Mario Fernandez. Death penalty case. These things are rare in, in situations like this, right? I mean... This is someone um, who has a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. Her family has access to tens of millions of dollars. But let me put this up on the screen. This is from Florida Times Union. Um, will Shanna Gardner and Mario Fernandez Saldana, that's her new husband, right? That's, that's who she's married to, be prosecuted together? Yes, the state attorney's office said they are on the same indictment and will proceed together through the judicial process. Now look at this next one from August 18th, same day. Her public relations representative told the Times Union she was just going to be the last name Gardner at this point, not Gardner Fernandez. Okay, the Fernandez comes from her new husband, Mario Fernandez Saldana, right? So, first of all, she's got a public relations representative, okay? I mean, how many of our murder cases where one, one spouse has a PR person, right? This is, this is different. This is different, folks. But she's getting rid of her husband's last name off of her name. What does this all mean? Let's bring back in our guests, uh, Vess Mitev, uh, John DeSimone, Dr. Janie Lacey. Vess, let me start with you. Um, sounds to me like she's trying to distance herself from her husband, Mario. And as we know, Mario is the one who has the more direct connection to the admitted hitman in this case. It was a former tenant of his in some property that, that he owned or managed. So what do you think this all means, that she's dropping the Fernandez from her name? Well, one of the things you always do in, in criminal defense cases is the first thing you do is you try to sever the indictment. You try not to be prosecuted along with the other co-defendants. And the reason for that is you don't want the jury imputing guilt of another defendant to your client. And that works both ways. You don't want the jurors saying, well, the other person did it, so they must be guilty by association. So it's clearly that she's dropping the last name because she wants to sever the association in the jurors' minds, even if they are tried together. And it was good of the state's office to say that they will be going through the process together, but that yet remains to be seen. I mean, defense motions are filed all the way up until the eve of trial. I mean, they're routinely denied. Most co-defendants end up getting tried together, but it's it's a clear uh, and it's, it's a good, solid defense strategy. You don't want to be in the mix. You want separate trials if you can have it, especially in a conspiracy, you know, where it's one plus, right? It's, it's the higher, you know, the person who was hired and then the person who told them to do the killing. Uh, there, the, the, there's an overwhelming uh, potential for imputing guilt from one defendant to the other, especially because most of these cases end up, as you know, uh, with a plea, with the trigger man or trigger woman rolling up and rolling over on the conspirator who hired them for the plot. 
Now, Jim, I want you to take a look at this. Um, Gardner Fernandez, now known as just Gardner, uh, this is from Fox News Report, grew up in a Mormon community in upscale Alpine, Utah. The daughter of Sterling and Shelley Gardner, who co-founded Stampin' Up!, which sells paper craft products. The family company, headquartered in Salt Lake City, has an estimated annual revenue of over $100 million a year, according to Inc. Fact. So... Right now, she's fighting extradition. Um, it's a death penalty case. What role does all this wealth play into this defense and into this case and into this trial? Well, the extradition request, just uh, it, it, objection, just serves to delay things. She's going to be brought to Florida and Governor DeSantis. Even though it's a death penalty uh, case, it's not like when you're extraditing someone from another country where the death penalty becomes a big issue? I don't think Washington has the grounds to refuse an extradition based on the death penalty. Now, it is interesting that in terms of the constitutional protections and due process of law that DeSantis recently signed a bill where you only need eight out of 12 for a death penalty in Florida. Very unique and uh, seemingly unfair in terms of the way criminal prosecutions usually go, which you need a unanimous verdict to put somebody away. Here, you only need eight jurors to put somebody to death. I mean, it's well, it a really recommendation to the judge. Judge makes the ultimate decision. It's just a recommendation. Judge can accept it or reject it, right? So a little bit of leeway Fair there. Fair enough. So if you, you could still get a unanimous ju jury verdict, but I don't think her money is going to be able to buy her way out of uh, this prosecution in terms of the way things are going down, because you have so much evidence in terms of the link between her ex-husband and the murderer and what would possibly could be his motive to have her ex-husband murdered in a situation where, um, you know, he just is playing a passive role. They have no children uh, together. Jim, let me let me ask you this, Jim. Here. Let me ask you this. It's, it's a death penalty case for a husband and wife, right? Mario and Shanna. Do you think prosecutors say, hey, Mario, you, you, you testify against Shanna and we'll give you life instead of death? I think that's a distinct possibility because she's been described as the mastermind. She's the one with the motive. And when you think about the heinous way in which she had her husband killed, if this is true, with his two-year-old daughter in, in the back of that vehicle, I mean, that is a situation that is just beyond the pale in terms of anyone's. It's, it's just outrageous, beyond human expectations that someone would have someone murdered in front of their child. Dr. Janie Lacey, what... What impact do you think growing up wealthy and being the daughter of, of wealthy parents could have played in the way that she allegedly handled everything that was happening in her life? Well, not knowing her specific situation, but situations similar, right? There sometimes can grow up if the parenting is not what we would put on a healthy spectrum. Can grow, the child can grow up entitled. They can be used to getting their way. And there, especially when there's endless resources, there's not necessarily sometimes potential consequences for wrong decisions or behaviors because of other potential things that can be put into place. So what we will see is this entitlement that can essentially come through through adulthood where you're used to getting your way you're used to either bullying your way seducing your way or when no comes or some level of consequences you're going to find a way around it and we look at that as that entitlement um, dynamic that can potentially happen when someone grows up and there's not a lot of adversity or, or there's not a lot of consequences or potentially having to work for the things that they would have when we look at a normal spectrum where there are um, certain things in place so potentially we can look at those things in this case as well Great job tonight, Vess Mitev, Jim DeSimone, Dr. Janie Lacey, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Hope to see you really, really soon.